Hi, I'm driving a 2017 Seat Toledo 1.0 TSI Excellence. Holy Toledo, it's a Seat Toledo. You would be forgiven for forgetting that Seat ever built the Seat Toledo, but they did from 1991 to 2018, four generations of the thing. But is this unrelentingly practical Spaniard worth your attention? Let's find out. Except that technically, it's not Spanish. Being part of the Volkswagen Empire, Seat now have access to a wide array of platforms, and this is slightly incongruous with their new racy image. They were billed at one point as the new Spanish Alfa Romeo, and I think that what they were shooting for there was rather than shonky build quality on the, just uh, the cusp of uh, bankruptcy, they were going for exciting handling cars with a bit of dynamic flair and exciting styling. This is a Skoda Rapid, so it kind of misses on two of those counts. So it was built alongside the Skoda Rapids in the Czechoslovakian plant. And that means that rather than the famous MQB platform, this is built on an A05 Plus or PQ25 platform, which it shares with the Skoda Rapid, which means that it's not actually a saloon, it's a liftback, and it is enormous inside. So this will become a firm favorite with practical family people, taxi drivers, anyone who's got to shift a lot of stuff, because this looks like a traditional three box saloon, but it is not. In the style of the big Skodas, also beloved of taxi drivers, this is a lift back, a hatchback. And in the back here, we've got 550 litres of space. This technically makes it bigger than a Mercedes E-Class, a BMW 5 Series, or a Jaguar XF in a car based on the previous generation Polo. Put a body in the boot, you can fit a cemetery in here. It is absolutely vast. If you're into adventure sports, mountain climbing, mountain biking, kayaking, anything that takes you off the beaten track and has you camping for the weekend, this would be fantastic. You could sleep in this car so easily and have your bike in here with you. Um, this is just absolutely cavernous. And as well as that, you've got enormous solid plastic hooks on both sides to hang things on. You've got big pockets on the side, which I think are actually removable. More lash down points up here on the top, more lash down points here on the bottom. Uh, there's a lighter 12 volt socket and under the floor here, there's a full-size steel spare wheel. How often do you see that these days? It even comes with a luggage net that you can stretch across the metal lash down points on the floor. It's a cavern on a car. Basically, this is a driving seat with space behind it. Now, the only thing I don't like about this boot is its lip. It is, however, how much that is, I'm gonna say around 20 centimeters. It's this much of a drop from the entrance to the floor. So if you're hauling something big like a washing machine or furniture, you've got to get it up over here and then down into there and then out again, which could be a real pain. If it's just shopping and bits and pieces and I don't know what else, not so much of an issue, but anything huge and bulky, that's gonna really grind your gears. Also, I've just noticed there's a little symbol for the warning triangle and little clippy things where you can attach a warning triangle, but they seem to have uh, not given the owner, Mr. Tweed Jacket Reviews, a triangle with this car. He should get onto his dealership. So this car came out in the UK in 2013. I think it was in, in Europe in 2012. By that time, Sayat's new styling direction had gone very, very angular and sharp and the incredible creases down the side. And this car lacks a lot of that. They've played a bit towards it with these sharp edges here on the bonnet. And they've put the standard Sayat face with these sharp edges in the trapezoidal uh, grille and the lower grille to make it look like a Sayat. It lacks a certain element of edginess that the Ibiza and the Leon have now got. But having said that, it does come with these incredible LED headlamps and turning fog lights. So as you turn the wheel left or right with the headlights on, it will project the fog lights in the direction you're going, which makes turning a little easier. If you've driven literally any other Seat from their range in the last couple of years, everything on this dashboard in this instrumentation will be very familiar to you. Uh, if you've driven a Leon or an Ibiza, you will, or even any of their SUVs, the Ateca and the other ones, you will know all about this gear knob, this infotainment system, these dials and this steering wheel. It's standard Seat fare. And that's a good thing because it's extremely high quality. <laughs> it's basically the same equipment that goes into the Audis and the Volkswagens, just with a slightly different trim on it so it's got their own differentiation to make it look like say its own gear but the electronics underneath are all Volkswagen group because unlike a few years ago when some of their electrics were a little bit dicey in the early noughties they've actually come on pretty well now so what does it get you this is the excellence trim which is as loaded as it's going to get so you've got Alcantara and half leather seats you've got a six-speed manual gearbox and auto was an option but virtually no one took it it's got sat nav and DAB it can have CarPlay and Android Auto 
but it's in there, but it's not automatically activated. You have to take it back to the dealer and pay 200 pounds to get that turned on, which I find a little bit tight. If you're already buying a top of the range car and making you pay 200 quid to have a feature that's already hidden in the car, bad say it, bad say it. Anyway, let's look around the car more orderly. On the door, you've got a nice padded armrest, which is good. It's like a, I think a faux leather on the door. And then you've got four electric windows. So all around you, you're fully automated and a lockout so the kids don't drive you nuts. You have a nice chrome door handle, which feels a little plasticky, but fairly solid. I don't think it's gonna break off anytime soon. And you've got your electric mirror switch, but not only for left and right adjustment, but also push upwards, you've got heated mirrors on this thing. Below that, you have got vast door pockets. As I said earlier, this car is relentlessly practical. You've got a big kind of bottle holder in the front of the pocket, and you've got a vast swathe of space here. You could find indigenous tribes living in here. The uh, owner of this car, he actually mislaid his wife for several days. Turned out she's in the door pocket. There's also an extremely large speaker cover because Sayats do actually come with quite nice audio. So we've got a big speaker in the door. Luckily, although the car's not massively wide, it doesn't really intrude very much at all and you don't notice it's there. So here we have the standard Sayat switch. It's a, a nice, nice feeling turn dial. One click for side, second click for dip. And if you want fog lights, pull once for rear, twice for front. And this car does have a dusk sensor. So as the light falls, it'll dim your instruments for you, but it doesn't have an automatic headlight setting. So it might trick you into thinking you've got your headlights on because the instruments have dimmed. Then we've got the usual vintage, four adjustable vents, which you can control the speed and the volume of the output of, as well as the angle. Little side vents pointing up to the windows. You're never gonna miss up unless you willfully do something silly like turning everything off and stick it on recirculate on a rainy day. This car has got keyless entry and keyless start, but there's no switch down here in the center of the dashboard for the engine start stop. It's here where you'd expect the usual turning key to be. So as long as the key is present, you can turn the car on. Depress clutch to start and off again on the same button. The steering wheel, again, completely standard Seat. It's a really nice feeling leather item. It's, it's very sporty. It doesn't have the flat bottom of some of the FRs and uh, Coopers, but it does have this nice little kind of cut out V section in the bottom, which always has the logo for the model you're in. This is the X for excellence on this car. It's also got volume and tuning controls for the radio on the left, and you've got other sort of dashboard controls so you can control your instrumentation and whatever's flashing up in front of you in the center of there on the right. And of course, a dramatic horn. Looking through the steering wheel, our switch gear. Again, standard SAS. Obviously, indicators and wipers on the left and right, but also you've got cruise control settings on the left-hand stalk as well. Now the dashboard and dials, I'm going to say it again, it's the same as on a Leonora and Ibiza, but they are beautifully crisp, legible, big round dials for your taco and your temperature gauge on the left and your speedo and your fuel gauge on the right. They've got a nice chrome ring around the edge. In the center, you've got an LCD readout, which can give you all kinds of different information. As well as your total mileage and trip mileage at the bottom, it'll tell you your economy, your range, uh, functions about the, the service requirements, or what radio station you're in, and if you're on sat-nav, it'll tell you where to go amongst many other things, all controlled from the steering wheel. Now this radio or infotainment system is quite an advanced thing. It's off the pre-facelift Leon. It's touch screen as well as these rather useful um, physical buttons on the side. On the later generation Leons, they dispensed with these physical buttons and put everything as a touch screen and everyone hated it. It was really hard to use. This is actually a far better system to use. It's got nav, traffic, uh, DAB, FM, you name it, and as I said earlier, the CarPlay and Android, which is turned off. Bad say it. Below this, you've got your HVAC, your ventilation. It's got heating on the left, fan speed on the right. It's not got dual zone, which is um, something of a surprise on an excellence model car, because quite often on say at top of the range, they will bung uh, dual zone climate on. And below that, we can turn off our parking sensors, because they're parking sensors front and rear, and turn off our automatic start stop for traffic, should we wish to kill the polar bears. Finally, at the bottom of this stack, we come to a good thing and a bad thing. First of all, a good thing. There is a huge, great cubby hole here at the back. You can stash parking tickets, receipts, uh, chocolate bars, phones, you name it. Now this is illuminated with an LED, same as in the door pockets and behind the handles, which is a really nice uh, touch. Gives it a bit of a premium feel. And also I should mention there's a USB and an auxiliary socket in here. So you can charge your phone and you can connect your 
music devices to the car in any which way you like. But if, below that, and in front of the gear shift, there is Seat's favorite signature rubbish thing. On the left, you've got a tiny, tiny cup holder, so small, barely a thimble can fit in it. And to the right, there is a slightly smaller cup holder, which you can't fit a cup into. Even a McDonald's paper cup won't go into that. And the one on the left, I've no idea what will go into that. It is, I'm gonna measure this later on because I didn't think to bring a tape measure like I usually do. That's barely four centimeters across and the one on the right, I don't know, it's hopeless. I've got a cup here and not only is it far too small to fit into the thing, it's too, too low. This is, oops, this is ridiculous, this is insanity. What are you thinking, Sayat? This is ugh, the worst bit of design in a car ever. Don't get me started on T-shelves. Where's your T-shelf? There's no cup holders, no T-shelf. I'm angry. No check mark car, bad car. Back to good stuff. The gear shift, six speed manual. The Seat six speed manual is really good. It's a very light change. It's very responsive, very easy to click in and out, but it's a nice gearbox. It's a nice light, easy throw, and you can just dance it back with your fingers. So points redeemed for having a nice gearbox. Don't buy the auto on these because just don't buy an auto. It's like Velcro shoelaces, just don't do it. Also redeeming points on this car, it's got a real handbrake, not one of those stupid plastic things. I don't know why manufacturers insist on doing this, apart from to make lots of money in their service departments in 10 years time when they'll break. But everyone hates them. But this has got a proper, real handbrake. I like this, points redeemed. And you've got a 12 volt socket down here, so you can plug in a sat nav or charge your phone. In fact, you're not gonna plug in a sat nav, you've got one just there. But you can charge your phone, but this is a slightly awkward position, so neutral points. And then, we also have a really irritating armrest. If you're on the motorway on a very long journey, this is probably okay. But the rest of the time, it's really in the way. It puts your arm just slightly too high to change gear easily, and you can't reach the handbrake very easily either without kind of really stretching and slightly awkwardly holding your wrist. So this is more of a hindrance than a help. Um, there is a cubby in the top of it, so it's there. Let's look in the back. In the back, you can see why, again, this is a favorite with taxi drivers and families because there's a ton of knee room, pretty decent headroom, and lots of space. It's got a cup holder, which is so big that the cup actually wobbles in it, in the back, and a slightly smaller one, which again, is too small for a cup, and because there is a protrusion, you can't actually get a cup into it. I don't know. But there is two USB charging sockets, which is very handy, so both Kids in the back can charge their iPad. You've got little map pockets in the back of there. Grab handles with coat hook holders, which is good. And again, absolutely vast door pockets. And a big old pull down armrest, which is actually really deeply padded and feels very nice indeed. And it's got three cup holders in it. None of which are big enough for a cup. Do you only drink tiny espressos in Spain or something? Seriously say it. I used to have this problem with Leon's as well and had them as everyday cars. What's going on with Seat and Cups? Useless. Incidentally, these seats do fold down to make what was already a huge boot become ridiculously big. Worth mentioning, there is also a ski hatch because if you happen to be holding a ski championship in the boot, you can continue here for refreshments and that pro ski. Shooting on a GoPro because I've literally just discovered this thing after I put everything away. This car's got a CD player in it still, um, but to get to it, you have to take everything out of the glove box and uh, it's hidden right at the very back. It also has SD card slots for the nav uh, maps to live on. Um, Say, easy connect, just not that easy to get to. Also, you can turn off your passenger airbag in the glove box and it would appear it's got an air conditioned, chilled glove box for keeping your Mars bars cool. This tiny, tiny little block of metal lost in the middle of this engine bay is the one litre three cylinder turbo TSI engine knocking out 110 horsepower, which will take this car to 0 to 60 in 9.9 .9 seconds. This here is the same coolant bottle or coolant reservoir that's been in production with Volkswagen Audi since about 2000 and nothing. It's in every VW ever, apparently. It looks like a tiny nuclear reactor. In fact, this may be why the car feels as powerful as it does, because it's got a tiny reactor on board. 
This may or may not be true. This is a post facelift car, and by the time they were producing this car, they were doing ridiculous deals, like £8,000 off or more, at your main dealer to get rid of them. And there was this and a 1.6 litre diesel available, but no one bought the diesel, because the deal on this thing was just so ridiculous. Why would you? Now this car is all about comfort. So you sink into these half leather, half Alcantara seats, crank the motor, which just burbles ever so quietly. Grip the nice leather steering wheel. The light gear shift is no effort, and it's got a nice tight turning circle and very light pedals, and away we go. And it's a three cylinder engine, so it's a slightly unusual sound. It's like driving half a Porsche 911. As it revs, you get that slight Porscheiness of sound which you may be familiar with if you've driven a lot of Porsche 911s. Yeah, you know, like, like I have. Honest. Or if you accelerate hard next to one with the window open, you can pretend it's your car. Because it's three-cylinder as well, there's not the same smoothness you get with a four-cylinder, but the transmission does a very good job of, of hiding that, so it doesn't come across too badly. Now for a brief potted history of the uh, Toledo, it first appeared on the market back in 1991, and then was replaced by the Generation 2, in 1998. The Generation 2 ran until 2004 and obviously replaced by logically the Generation 3. And then it wasn't replaced. Sayat then bought in the previous generation Audi A4 and rebadged it as the XAO and completely killed this particular area of car and just had the slightly, well actually much larger vehicle instead. Um, but that was until 2012 when they brought back this car which looks a lot more like a Sayat. Because when you hit corners in this car it is quite soft. It leans quite a long way and you can feel the back end just starting to, to drift a little and the front inner wheel starting to lose traction a tiny bit. But that's not really what it's aimed for. It's more, it's more of a cruiser, it's a practical car for putting lots of stuff in and driving economically. It's a one litre TSI after all. And this is the thing, when you've got a one litre TSI, your driving style can adapt to one of two ways. Either you can embrace the eco lifestyle and you can try and eke out the absolute best MPG from every journey, become a true hypermiler in a very real sense. Or, and I'm not going to say this is me, but this is me, um, you can find yourself being really frustrated by the lack of power and driving everywhere in third gear at the red line and getting around 20 MPG. I would recommend the former not the latter. Now this roundabout, the Alpha absolutely encouraged me to hoon the other day. I'm going to have a little go at hooning here and it feels like it's understeering. It wants to go straight on rather than playing with the corner. The car does lean quite a lot, that's the thing, but then it's not designed not to. If this was a Cupra or even an FR from Sayat, it would be sticking to the road quite differently. Although there wasn't actually a Europe there wasn't actually a British trim level of an FR in this car. There was on the continent. Apparently at least one person has managed to find the body kit and the wheels to create their own FR, I presume with the same suspension as well, which would be a bit firmer sprung. But once you get onto a faster road with just easy traffic this is where the car comes into its own, dual carriageway, motorway. You can just let it get into a high gear, hit the cruise control, and you can just sit back and enjoy the peace, the quiet, the comfortable ride, the lack of noise coming into the cabin, the fact it's all just pleasant, really. You can even put your armrest down, maybe a bit of Radio 4, the afternoon play might be on, or some comedy. Enjoy that for a bit. The only thing that's going to be a bit of a bummer is the fact you've got nowhere for your coffee, apart from back here, which is slightly awkward to reach when you're driving. This car still reckons it's getting 38.8 mpg, even despite my silly hooning, but the official figures are 61.4 or 60.1, depending on the, what you read, um, but the owner has had 62 out of it on a long journey, so uh, it's a car you can get silly mileage out of. This is the thing, if you're after an insanely practical car, this is it. It gets great economy, it's quite comfortable, you can put everything, literally including the kitchen sink and the unit it came out of, in the boot. You've got kids who are going to be happy with the multiple USBs. Apart from the cup holders, it's, it's a really good car. 
People who own them absolutely love them. The only thing is, it's wearing the wrong badge. As a Skoda, it makes perfect sense because it really does fit the whole ethos of practical, sensible motoring. It's, it's a corduroy car in that respect. As a Seat, which is meant to be the exciting, dynamic, fun to drive car, it kind of misses the point a little bit as this brand, but then they've also got things like the Alhambra, which is one of the best selling MPV people carriers on the market, because that's also brilliant, but completely at odds with Seat's image or their intended image. I guess that's why they've killed it now. But it's a shame because it was a great car. These cars represent astonishing value. And it was 22,000 list price new, but by the end, they were knocking virtually half that off to get them out of the showrooms. And now you can pick up a two-year-old car for about 7,000 pounds. And that's loaded with all the kit you expect today. And with the uh, remainder of the manufacturer's warranty on it as well. That's quite a good deal really, isn't it? Now this being an excellence is a one year only model because they brought out this trim level just before they discontinued it. That means you get the LED headlights, you get the DAB infotainment system, you get the little LED lights in the doors, you get the dual uh, USB sockets in the back and just the general nice ambience of being in here with your piano black bit on the dashboard. It's a nice trim level for, n well, not a lot more money. Well, thank you for joining me on this review of an overwhelmingly practical and actually quite nice car. It's amazing practice. It's amazing value. If you're looking for a family car or a load hauler, don't want to spend a lot of money but want a lot of kit, this is the car for you. I hope you've enjoyed this and found it useful, practical buying advice. If not, sorry. Either way, if you liked it or not, just hit like, hit like, subscribe. Either way, whether you liked it or not, hit like and hit subscribe and hit that bell notification thing so next time I put out some drivel, you know to avoid it or something. But thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.